everybody, Wayne here. In today's Let's Play, we're going to do a tutorial playthrough of Lee's Greatest Victory, Chancellorsville 1863, designed by Michael Ronella and published in Against the Odds magazine number 55. This video will probably just do the first turn, which um, the game is broken up into six turns, so there's, and there's quite a bit of action during each turn, so you guys should get a pretty good idea of both, you know, this how the system works and then how this particular game plays. Um, I do have a recon, so one of my, you know, unboxing slash unbagging videos for this game already, and I will have a overview and review video coming um, probably a few days after this video goes up. So um, we'll do a, a little bit of an overview first, I'll kind of explain the map and the units quick, and then uh, we'll dive into the actual playthrough. So let's go. Okay, so Lee's Greatest Victory is an area impulse game. What does that mean? It means a couple things. One, the map itself is divided up into different areas and also zones on the outer edge. So the areas are going to be all the different, you know, irregularly shaped areas here, primarily um, separated by these dotted lines, but also using either minor or major rivers for the Rappahannock here, you can see, for example, labeled um, to dif differentiate the different areas. In addition to those areas around the board, the perimeter, you can see zones. You can see I have some units set up. This is the initial uh, initial setup for the game. Um, so you could move between zones and areas, areas and zones, as long as there's arrows there and as long as uh, the movement allows it. This game in particular has some special rules concerning movement. Um, a big part of the game is the wilderness over here. You can see that the areas within each area is a circle. The top number is just the number of that area area 26, area 29, etc. The bottom number, that's going to be the um, terrain modifier, and that affects combat. The higher the number, the better for the defender. And you can see these areas here, they're colored a little different. There's green on the bottom for the terrain. And you can start seeing actual woods, you know, art pop up in those areas. Obviously, that's the wilderness. In those areas, Generally speaking, you can move, you know, freely between areas. When it comes to the wilderness, you have to follow a road. So there's some areas you can't necessarily move between. For example, you can't move directly from 39 to 51 because there's no connecting road in between. The wilderness terrain was too thick um, for these combat units to move. Now, the last thing about the terrain that I want to mention is you can see these here. These are areas where pontoon bridges can be built by the Union. You need an engineer in an adjacent area. You go ahead and you build a pontoon bridge. The game starts with one over here at Reynolds Crossing. You can build more with the engineer. That allows the union to go ahead and move units over to the other side of the rivers here. The Confederates will never move into the union area up here. So basically the Rappahannock and the Rapidan right here, it's going to be Confederates and then the unions are going to be coming over to fight them here. Speaking of the units... Pretty standard as far as what the combat units look like. Here we have a leader, sickles, and I should probably have, by the way, um, some information popping up throughout this video, as I usually do with my with my videos. So um, you can see the units here. There also is a cavalry unit as well and then there is the engineer but i'm not going to grab him because only a few of them and really they're just used to build the pontoon bridges for the union pretty standard you have the attack factor the defense factor and then the movement factor obviously you can see infantry so it uses kind of that nato symbology but it's actually crossed bayonets you have artillery which will be able to do bombardments leaders which are going to give a possible combat bonus and then you have your cavalry, which, again, kind of the NATO symbol for cavalry, but it is a saber. So what you're going to be doing in this game, and we'll go very in-depth, you know, as we do the actual playthrough, but I just want to cover it quick, give you a general idea. I mentioned area impulse. We looked at the areas. Now, the impulse, what does that mean? What it means is that you're going to be activating an area for different action. Now, they're called assault, bombardment, however... Assault is kind of a misnomer because you may not be actually attacking. What it is is you're activating an area. If you activate for an assault, you can activate all the units that are in that particular area. You can then attack if there are already you know, enemy units there. You can move them using their movement factor. And then, you know, obviously there's going to be rules for that. Move them into different areas, maybe engage in more combat, maybe not. Bombardment, we have artillery. They can attack 
adjacent. They can attack within the same area. Um, or you can go ahead and pass. Now with the impulse system, how it works, you can see we have the track way over here in the far right. And again, we'll kind of we'll get into it more as we play. But basically, one side is going to start with momentum. And they're going to maintain momentum. They're going to do an impulse. Each impulse is going to be one of those activations, right? So say, do an assault activation. The Confederates do if they have the, the momentum. And they can activate, move those units. They're done. Done with that impulse. You then move the impulse marker up on the track. And now it goes from the 1 to the 2. You're going to roll a 1d6. You're going to want to roll that number or higher to maintain momentum. It means you get to keep acting. If you roll less than whatever the current impulse is, the play passes, the momentum passes to the other side. So you never know exactly how many um, actions you're going to get to take per impulse. Now, same thing for the other side, right? They're going to be acting. They're going to make different activations. The impulse keep going up. Far, the higher it goes, the less chance you're going to maintain momentum, and eventually it's going to switch back to you. You're basically going to go back and forth like that until all the units are exhausted. The units will have, we look at the front side, very simple. That's their fresh side. The back side is exhausted side. So when you're moving a unit, engaging in combat, when you're done, you flip it over to its exhausted side. Unit scale, I believe, is primarily primarily brigades for the Confederates, division for the Union. However, it's not one to one. You know, this isn't a hex encounter game where it's exactly, you know, yep, this is a this is a, every one of these is a brigade. Every one of these, it's not that way. Um, it's a it's a little more abstracted than that, especially when you look. You know, traditionally the Union um, in this battle historically, I should say, you know, outnumbered the Confederates significantly. In the game, you're seeing similar amount, uh, similar number of counters. Again, that's why I mentioned sort of the brigade on the Confederates and then the increased, or uh, excuse me, the uh, division, so increased scale for the Union. I think that covers the basics. Um, in the game, you know, you're going to be, for the Union, you're trying to capture victory points locations here or possibly build a path all the way of control all the way down here to these. If you're able to do that, you're going to win a sudden death victory. Pretty hard to do. Or capture VP locations and eliminate enemy units, add up victory points, a victory point track up there at the end of the game. Other than that, I think that's good enough for the overview. Let's go ahead and dive into the actual gameplay. All right, first turn, the Union begins with momentum. And I'll run through, you know, and I'll explain each of the phases, how combat works, etc. You know, it's very similar to Michael Ronella's other area impulse game. So if you watch my previous videos or if you've played the games before, it's going to be very comfortable to you. So, and I did go ahead and put my dice tower up here. I'm going to be rolling a bunch of dice. So just be prepared for that. We shouldn't really necessarily need to use those areas here. So as I said before, you know, it's the Union and they're really, you know, just, you know, historically, right? They're pushing in, making their moves, you know, crossing closer to Fredericksburg, crossing over, crossing over here, trying to flank the Confederates and the Confederates will be responding to that. All right. First, first turn, momentum phase. Union automatically has momentum on turn one. Uh, momentum phase, starting with turn two, you're going to roll, each side's going to roll off with some DRMs, some die roll modifiers with these white stars, giving a plus one for whichever side controls them. I'll go ahead and cover that. I'll do that at the beginning of turn two. As for turn one right now, we'll just dive into the unit having the momentum here. So after the momentum phase is the combat phase, and this is where the majority of the game is played. You know, this is where you're going to have those impulses, right? I mentioned the assault, the bombardment, or passing. So, put it back here. Now, and I'll have, again, I'll have a camera, I'll have some uh, play rate stuff pop up for you guys, and I'll try to zoom in and show different areas as I go instead of repositioning my camera constantly, um, which is a, a huge drain on my energy and resources. It makes me not want to do these videos. So, I'm going to try to do zoom in method, and uh, let me know how that works in the comments below. So, all right, we have the, again, the turn impulse track over here. It's turn one, and the turn track marker has the blue side for to show the union has an advantage. I'll explain that in a second. Um, and then the other side is butternut to show when the Confederates start to turn with the advantage. We know the union started, so they get advantage to start. Impulse marker. Um, it doesn't come with a thing to differentiate between union or uh, Confederate. So I just use it where when the white side is up, that's the union. And the, you know, blank butternut side, that's the Confederates. They have the impulse. They have the momentum. So... Impulse one, automatic, they get to go, you don't have to roll, you don't have to start rolling until impulse two. What's the union going to do? Well, they want to get their forces going here, and they want to get moving, and they want to get, you know, flanking on the Confederates here, catch them by surprise, catch them napping. So, 
Over here in zone H, we have Howard and his troops, and then we have the Colgate Engineer Unit. We want to get them moved off into the wilderness. To do that, though, we do have to build a pontoon bridge there. Thankfully, we have an engineer. Huh. When you do the setup, you get to actually put the Union Engineers where you want to as long, um, with a leader, I believe it has to be. So in this case, one of them placed right here. So we go ahead and we're going to activate Zone H. And before we, for an assault activation, first action we're going to do, Colgate, we're going to go ahead and flip him over to his exhausted side, allowing us to build a pontoon bridge right here, connecting. This will allow two things. One, allow us to move into the wilderness from here, and this will allow um, Slocum's troops here to move to this zone and then follow across. So Howard, he's going to go ahead and start moving his men. Now, special rule for this zone, when you move into the wilderness, so you move from zone H into area 53 here, it automatically uses up all their movement factors. So they'll be done as soon as they enter area 53. So let's move Howard first. And now as all these areas here, right, are Confederate controlled. There's a USA control marker here, except this one. And then all these are Union controlled. They'll never change hands again. Confederate troops can't move up there. So for here, we have a whole thing of control markers for the U.S. Union side. So we'll go ahead and place it here to show that now the U.S. controls this area. And that can come in um, to play when it comes to retreating, um, the combat, etc. So now, again, he used up all the moving factors. So we'll flip them over. And we'll go ahead and finish it off with the rest of them. They're all going to move into that same area then he stays so there we go went ahead and move simple done for that um, actual activation so now we go ahead and move the impulse marker up to second impulse and now here's where we roll right we roll that 1d6 as the union we want a two or higher <laughs> so we did not get a two or higher we got a one what does that mean that means that the union messed up they lost momentum something bad happened whatever the Confederates noticed quicker than the Union expected, that's for sure. So we move the impulse marker back down to one. And again, I will just, I like to flip it over to show the butternut side. I wish we had a, the mark, I wish it was full. I wish it just said, you know, maybe Union impulse, Confederate impulse, but you know, it is what it is. All right, so we'll flip that over. That's how the Confederates are going to get to start acting. Now, just like the Union, they get to pick an area, you know, assault, bombard, etc. What are they going to do? Hmm. So we know there's movement over here. Maybe our scouts detected. Maybe that's why, you know, you could abstract it in your mind, right? Well, how did that happen? You know, build yourself a narrative as you're playing, right? Well, obviously, some scout, somebody, someone who lived over there said, hey, the union's coming over here. Oh, really? So well, how are we going to act? How are we, what are we going to do? How are we going to respond? Let's go ahead. The Confederates, let's go ahead. They're going to go ahead and activate. They know they have a threat up here and know they're going to start having units over here. So let's go ahead and activate area 15 for an assault activation. Now you have, you can see lead, leader unit, you have AP Hill, and I have a big stack. Basically, those are all his units here. They're all infantry units. I just have them in a stack because I know that it's, it's going to be easier to move them around. So we're acting in this area. I think we should probably send reinforcements over here. Don't you think to meet the Union flanking attack here? I think so. So let's go ahead and activate him, and we'll start moving him. Now... Spending your movement factor, and all these infantry and the leaders will have five movement factor. There's a special rule that later turns, if the Confederates start with momentum, they actually get plus one to their movement factor. Any unit that has a five, which is everything except cavalry, so it'd be have six movement factor. But as of now, it's just five. So movement's very simple. Um, entering a vacant area, which you know there's no enemy units, is just one movement factor if it's adjacent to enemy units it's going to cost two movement factors if it has exhausted three movement factors if it has a fresh unit a fresh enemy unit four movement factors so that just kind of shows that you know you can't just charge all the way and run right into combat you're going to maybe have to maneuver first you know get closer before you can really engage in combat be prepared for combat so let's start moving them i'd say one two three four five Yep, we'll go to uh, Area 44, enter the wilderness, which we're able to do. We have a road here, and flip him over. And just to speed it up, they're all, like I said, they're all the infantry. They'll follow the same path, follow through, and they're going to go ahead. I will spread them out, and then flip them over to their exhausted side. But I'll spread them out here so you guys can now start seeing the units. Okay? Now, just like with the Union, raise the uh, impulse up to two. Second impulse. I have now a gray die for them. 
a three, so they get to go ahead and keep momentum. And it's called the momentum retention check. Say that three times fast. Momentum retention check. Momentum retention check. I guess you can do it. Okay. If I can do it, anyone can do it. All right. So we have momentum. So we get to keep it going. What else are we going to do? We got plenty. Uni uh, the Confederates, they're like, oh, yeah, we, we're going to respond to this. Now we know the Union's going to, you know, Joe Hooker over here has decided to act. Let's, let's get defensive here. Or should I say aggressive? Not defensive, aggressive. All right. I think they're going to go ahead and the Confederates will activate zone C for an assault. So Pendleton, the artillery chief, right? Nelson and Cutts artillery units here. Go ahead and move them here. And now unlike over there, that has a special rule from Germana Ford that zone H, right? Used up all the movement factors here. It's like regular movement. One and then two. Well, they're next to fresh units actually. So three. So it takes two, excuse me. So would have been one, two, three. They still have some movement factors, but I think sitting up on Prospect Hill here is going to be a good spot. Because if you notice with the Triangle, Prospect Hill, and there's a couple other areas with triangles around. I think this was one right here. Yep, Fairview Hill. That gives an advantage to artillery. I moved him up. Flip him over. Cuts, go ahead. Same. And Nelson. Uh, should he move there? Yeah. yeah, he'll do the same thing. Okay. All right, and that was it for that area. So, impulse is done. Move up to the third impulse. We'll start moving things a little quicker here. A one, oh, they failed. So momentum retention check has failed. So boom, back to one, and now the Union gets to go. You see how it swings back and forth, right? Confederate, Union, Confederate, Union. You know, that that's the way this area impulse system works and also works well for solitaire, honestly, right? Because you, you don't, I had a plan. First I had a plan with the Union. Oh, that ended pretty quick. I had a plan with the Confederates. That ended pretty quick too. So now back to the Union. All right. What well, Union? Well, they are just getting started on their whole idea. So Start moving over there, but what they're going to do, let's go ahead and activate. They're going to activate. They want to maintain their toehold here across uh, Rappahannock over here. They don't want to lose it. They only have a couple units right now. And now they do have an entrenchment marker of two, which adds the defense, but it's not enough to them, right? They want some more action. So what they're going to do is they're going to go ahead and activate uh, Area 74 for bombardment. Excuse me, not bombardment, excuse me, assault. Assault activation. And they'll start sending... Uh, they'll send Sedgwick across. Yeah, they'll send Sedgwick across. So they'll send him just across the, uh, and you can only move five units across the pontoon. Although for stacking limits, they wouldn't be able to, it wouldn't be able to move that many anyway. Um, for stacking, the Union can stack six combat units, leaders not included, if they have their own division, uh, units of their own division in there, because they can stack with them the equivalent of, which you can tell they're the same division by the color. You know, for instance, Sedgwick, his unit, you can see, whoop, hopefully you guys can zoom in right on that, brown. Um, and then, you know, say Reynolds is yellow. All right. So let's go ahead, start moving Sedgwick across and flip him over to Exhausted. Howie, move him across. Um, Newton, move him across. And again, as you move and we finish your movement, they're going to stop there. As they finish their movement, they're going to be exhausted. It's really exhausting crossing a pontoon bridge here. Let's see. So, how many units do we have? How many coming? It's one, two, three, four. And then Cedric won't count because he can stack with them. So, they can have the union can have two more combat units. So, within this area, they're also going to go ahead and send the U.S. artillery across. And they'll send. So, New York is send further. Yeah, they're going to go ahead and send the New York artillery as well. Okay. Boom, and now they're full. So one, two, three, four, five, six units. And again, that's a seventh with the leader, but he stacks with them. So they're full stacking right here for the union. All right, that was first impulse. Go to the second impulse. Momentum retention check. Six, beautiful. For the union, you know, they're, or whoever side has momentum, they're going to want to roll in high every turn. Roll in higher they are. Because if you get up to six, if you keep rolling six, you're going to keep activating. Now, once all your units are, are exhausted, you're not able to do anything, well, it's game over. It, you know, there's nothing else you can do, so. All right, Union, what are they going to continue to do here? Well, they need to get more troops across the Rappahannock and the Rapidan over here. So they're going to go ahead and activate Area 56. They're going to Stuart here. They're going to flip him over, um, the engineer unit, and build Pontoon Bridge right here at Eli's Ford. Oh, and there they go. So Meade's going to go ahead and cross. Let's see. And that's one marker two 
marker. Three. Control marker. And, well, there's a road. There's only one way, so four, five. Two, because the adjacent fresh unit here, so it costs two. So I use up all the rest of his movement. And I'll put a control marker down. And we're going to go ahead and start sending his men across. Infantry, they're going to follow the exact same path. Right here. Right here. And right here. And then we have Pleasanton, his cavalry. So they'll go a different route. Um, Let's see here. What is, where do they want to go? Well, they kind of want to kind of screen the Confederate cavalry here. So let's go ahead and start sending them this way. So one, two. Momentum, or uh, control marker. Two, three. I'm kind of stuck there. Um, four. Yep, four. That's fine actually because they're they're spent. Oh no, they're adjacent to him. So four, five. So only has two movement factors left. Six and seven. Okay, there we go. Perfect. This is kind of moving down, sending the Pleasanton, the Union Cavalry down. Kind of maybe start screening these cavalry, screen their forces, you know, protect them as their infantry as they move up. All right, that impulse is done. So moving to the third impulse. Let's go ahead and give a momentum retention check. Five, good to go. All right, so we're going to continue this. They're going to activate area 61 here. Flip the engineer over. Going to build the last pontoon bridge so that it is limited by the counter mix. So... That's it for the pontoon bridges, You can, but you can remove them um, during the end turn, and so then you'll be able to replace or place them somewhere else in the next following turns. So, go ahead, like I said, we activated here. Couch, go ahead and move him across. One. And two, three. I think. Uh, yeah, he'll stop there. Perfect. And they'll follow. Follow the leader here. Oh. Hmm. I was thinking about doing... Hmm. Okay, so. We activated, right? We're done there. So we go to the fourth impulse. Now I'm trying to think if we should take advantage of the advantage. <laughs> so, what is this? You know what? We're going to do it just because I want you guys to see what it is. So... Each side, like I mentioned, when they start the turn, they have an advantage. They can use it when they want. They can use it for a couple different things. Um, they can re-roll, you know, either die roll of 2d6 or 1d6. They can do a rally, which happens during the reorganization phase, which is after all this. Once the turn is basically done, right, you're wrapping up the turn. Um, during the reorganization phase, you have to, you have, you know, limited units you that are not, you know, they're, they're limited off the board. It doesn't mean all the men are killed. That's not how it works, right? At, at this scale, of course, it's not all these men are dead. But you rallying them, basically. And normally, in the rules, you, you have to remove from the game one unit to bring one unit back. Well, with the rally, you can just go ahead and bring one back. Or the third and the big advantage like the big use of it that is a huge part of the game and i'll mention um, my thoughts on on that in the my overview and review video but basically it's the start of your impulse before you make the momentum die roll the player with momentum may use it to reset the impulse track it's called steal a march so you'll reset the impulse track to zero but not only that both players flip all their exhausted units back to their fresh side which obviously you can imagine creates a, you know kind of a huge reset. So it's not just resetting the I mean it's resetting the board. It's almost like all right, it's the beginning of the turn again. So you know now the thing is you can only use it once per side per turn, because with the advantage one side uses it, the marker is then flipped over, and then when the next when the impulse goes back to the other side, that side now has the advantage and they can go ahead and use their advantage whenever they want to, um, as long as it's the next impulse not within that same set of impulses. So. Union is going to go ahead and do it. So they're going to, let's go ahead and they'll flip, they'll flip their uh, um, game turn marker over. But they're going ahead and doing steal a march advantage or using it up. So impulse marker is reset back to one. So now they're not going to have to roll. And all these units on the board that were 
spent or exhausted, right? They're all flipped back to fresh. And again, that is both sides. So it does help the Confederates a little bit. Um, I think the Union's looking at it. It says, hey, you know what? We want to continue, though. Yes, it will help the Confederates a little bit. But we feel like we can really take advantage of it. We got some of our men moving over. We want to move up. We want to secure our positions. You know, maybe continue attempting to um, flank the Confederates. All right. Union has momentum. First impulse. They're going to go ahead. They are going to, hmm, what should they do? They're going to go ahead and activate Area 53 over here. Start moving these men up. So Howard and his men. One, an active force assault activation. Obviously, they can't do a bombardment. They don't have any artillery, and they're not going to pass. That'd be silly. So one, two, three, four. And they'll stop there. Unfortunately, not able to move into um, attack position or anything like that. And the rest of the men will follow the same path. Flipped over to exhausted. All right. First impulse done. So go to two. Then roll. Three. They maintain it. Maintain momentum. Momentum retention check completed, sir. Sir, yes, sir. All right. So boo -doo -doo -doo. what do we want to do, guys? What do you think? Um, I think we want to get an attack in here, don't you think? Let's let's see an attack. Yeah, let's do that. So, Union activating Area 42 for an assault activation. Meade and his men, they're ready to take this victory point spot away from Mahone and Posey over here. They're like, get out. We're, we're flanking you, and we're about to kick your butt. So, let's do this. So, go ahead and activate it. Let's go ahead and start moving the men. They're going to move from 42 to 43. Uh, that'll be, they are entering an area containing at least one fresh enemy unit, which takes four movement factors. They each have five, so it's perfect. We're not going to flip them over yet because we want to, you know, resolve the combat. Well, when you guys get to see the first combat. And what's kind of them there, as we can see. And boom. All right. Let's do this. So, combat resolution. Seems, seems complicated when you first, like, read it in the rule book and everything. It's not. It's not. There's just a lot of things you have to um, keep track of. However, the game does come with a player aid. Um, that lets you to figure out the attack value. So, combat is, you're comparing the attack value of the attacking units, which is a combination of factors that I'll discuss in a second, plus 2d6 for each side, against the defense value of the defending units, plus 2d6, right? So, here we go. Attack value. Let's do the attacker first. And now what I do, this does not come with the game, but what I do, and I've done some of my previous games in the videos, you've seen it, is I use uh, D20s to keep track of the attack value and defense value because my memory is not good enough to do all the calculations, do, 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 do all the math stuff. Remember, I'm a police officer, not a, you know, mathematician. So, <laughs> so I like to go ahead and use these to keep track of it for me. It makes it a lot easier. So I definitely recommend something like this. Maybe if, unless you can just, you know, do the math. I know a lot of you guys are like engineers, probably no problem, probably laughing at me. So attack value. What is that? It's the sum of the attack factor of the lead attacking unit. So go ahead and attacker designates a lead attacking unit, which we're going to want the highest attacks. So it's either Griffin or Sykes. We'll select Griffin with his three. Um, you're going to, the, the, you're going to see i'm just checking my chart here um okay so plus one for each additional fresh unit participating in the attack if confederate plus two if union and this is where it's kind of abstracted that well the union had you know more men how come you know they don't have more counters well they get a big bonus for their attacking not for defending but for attacking so plus two for each additional fresh unit so we have a starting with three right three four five six seven plus one for each supporting artillery and your artillery, fresh artillery in that area or adjacent. There are none for the Union, so no help there. Plus one, surprise, if attacking an area with wilderness terrain from another area with wilderness terrain, which they are. Remember, they moved from here to here. Remember the green marker? You can see, so if you're not sure about the art, just check for the green there. Boom, they are. So that's an additional plus one. Uh, there's also a plus one, plus one for a command integrity bonus for each command contributing three or more non-leader units to the assault. What does that mean? Just check the units. Obviously, these are all red, and you can see it has a symbol two for Mead. One, two, three. That's three or more. So you get a plus one for command integrity. And we're going to say our leader is leading from the front. That makes him uh, poss more likely to get injured or killed. But it is what it is. We want that plus one. That gives us an additional plus one. So add all that up. Three... Four, five, six, seven, eight, 
for surprise, nine for command integrity, 10 for leading from the front. So we take our blue D20, run 10. Now defender, defense factor, lead defending unit, and we'll do a little quicker in future combats, guys. I just wanna explain it, so like, again, I'm trying to teach, right? It's a tutorial video too. So lead defending unit, um, I'm gonna go ahead and pick, they'll pick Posey as the lead defending unit. Middle number is defense, right? Four, plus one, each additional fresh defending non-leader unit. One more, so it's additional one. So four becomes five. Uh, you add the TEM, the train modifier, which is three. That really helps them, makes it an eight. There is a plus one if there's a man when making a mandatory attack. If all the attacking units crossed a minor water boundary, they did not. The open, it's uh, just you know open train here. So for instance, if they attacked our units were here and they'd crossed this minor river here, it would have been a plus one for us, or for the Confederates here. They do not get that. Um, plus one for friendly leader unit present in the area, fresh or exhausted, no Confederate leaders, and then check for an entrench marker. There are no entrenchments, no defenses were built. So what is that? That is four, five, six, seven, eight. So the union has the advantage slight, but they do have the advantage. So those are the attack values and defense values. Now we want to go ahead and roll 2d6 for each side. We want to figure the attack totals and defense totals. All right, now we can look, now let's look at it. Ah, that was a one, so, okay. So for the Union, five plus 10, even I can figure that out, that's 15. Eight plus seven, 15. Tied stalemate. Hmm, now you do have one thing going on though. At the beginning of each turn, each side gets a re-roll, a combat re-roll, Marker. The attacker declares if they're going to use theirs first, and then the defender declares. Is the union is the union going to accept the stalemate? Or are they going to go ahead and say they want to re-roll? Um, let's go ahead. They're going to say they want to use a re-roll. They feel confident they can get the result they want, so they're going to spend theirs for a re-roll. So, what does it do? You have to re-roll both now. It's not just one side or the other. It's all the dice get re-rolled. So we'll go ahead and flip that over to used, and then you just place it on the turn track. Next turn. 2d6, 2d6. Let's go ahead and re-roll. See if it pays off for the union here. It looks like it sure did. So 8 plus 6. So the defenders will have 14. 7 plus 10, 17 for the attackers. Success. Attack total was greater than defense total. All attack units are flipped to their exhausted side. Just to show that, you know, they're tired. They got in combat. Flip them over. All right. Now, the defender has to absorb casualty points equal to the difference between the attack total and the defense total. Now, the difference was, was it, say it was 14 versus 17? So three casualty points have to be taken. The first casualty point has to be taken by that lead defender that I chose. So Posey, he has to take at least one of them. So again, there's three of them. And there's a chart that says basically a fresh unit that flips to exhausted is one. So we'll go ahead and flip him. And let's get these dice out of here, no longer needed. We, we know we have three casualty points. So that's one, Oop, flip him over. So that's one. Now he could retreat, that's another one. He could be eliminated which is two, so that would, it's two additional, right? So if one flip over, two to eliminate, so that'd be all of them. It would just be Mahone left. Um, You know, he could exhaust Mahone as well, move him, etc. It's your kind of choice how you want to sign him, other than the first one has to go to the lead defender. So I'd say let's flip him over to exhaust him. Let's go ahead and flip Mahone over. That's another one. And there's one left to take. We'll go ahead and, you know what? We got we to gotta do it. Let's go ahead and retreat. So go ahead and retreat Mahone. 29. Now, that's it. We've fulfilled the requirements. However, at the end of a combat, you can do voluntary retreat if you want. So, kind of maintain, you know, if you want to maintain your units together, you're not forced to keep him here alone. So, we're going to go ahead and retreat Posey with Mahone. The Union now has sole control of this VP area. So, they'll get a control marker to show that they control it. Looks like uh, may have paid off for him doing the, uh, doing the advantage, steal a march, but I guess we'll see. So, all right, that was that impulse. Let's go ahead to the next one.
Check for uh, momentum retention check. Sir, done. Successful. So the Union gets to go ahead and keep the momentum going. It's the next impulse. What are they going to do now? Hmm. Well, I'd like to move up here. Uh, I don't know what they'll do. Here's what they're going to do. So they're going to go ahead and activate Slocum in zone I. He's going to move over to zone H. And flip over to Exhausted. Start moving up more men. Cross over here. Impulse goes up to four. A one. Okay, so they failed the momentum retention check. So the impulse ooh, goes back down to one and it flips over. It is now the Confederates um, have momentum. In addition, remember that advantage marker, you know, next when the impulse changes to get it. So now the Confederates have the advantage. They could do the, you know, reroll for that. Different than this. Reroll, by the way, it's a different one. Um, seal a march or wait, just wait, you know, and eliminate or rally some eliminated units. So what are they going to do? I think what, what we should do, I think what the Confederates want to do, they don't like all this concentration union forces all crammed up in here. And they happen to have a bunch of artillery and, uh, oh, Pendleton, I didn't flip him over. He was definitely would have been fresh. Thanks to the seal of March. They want to do a bombardment. So that's what they're going to do. So for their first uh, first impulse, Confederates are going to do a bombardment, activate uh, area six for bombardment, targeting area three. And obviously they got a whole bunch of artillery and Pendleton. They're going to be, hopefully for them anyway, whooping butt. So how do you bombardment? Super simple. Go ahead and select an area. Like I said, we're going to select this area as the, um, as the attacking, the area we're going to attack. All right, check the um, attack factor of the, and we're going to obviously going to pick Macintosh. He's got a four, the best one. So let's go ahead and pick him. Four. Plus one for additional fresh artillery. One, two. So five, six. Um, plus two if the artillery is located on a friendly controlled vacant hill, which it is, Prospect Hill. So eight. Plus one if an artillery leader is leading from the front which we have Pendleton, we'll use him. So nine, so that's a nine for our attack factor. Put our little nine there. And now the defense factor, um, the TEM, the terrain modifier of the defensive area, which is only a one, not very de good defensive terrain. Plus one for each fresh artillery unit in the target area, you know, counter battery fire. Um, unfortunately for the Confederates, there is a couple Union units that are fresh. So that's two of them. So one, two, three. And for the entrenchment marker, and the Union has a two entrenchment, four, five. So it becomes five. So not as good of an advantage as you may have thought to begin. Okay, we'll just go ahead. And it's just like you would with the traditional uh, assault combat. Go ahead and do a roll off, 2d6 on each. Whoa, okay. So I gotta tell you right now, Confederates are like, no, we're not accepting this result. So obviously six plus the nine was 15. 12 plus five is like, now, even though the defenders are higher, there's no negative for the attacker when it comes to bombardment, right? Because it's, you know, range, range combat. Confederates go ahead, use their reroll marker, combat reroll. No, no, no. They say we, we are not going to accept a no result on that. We expected good results here with our artillery. So let's go ahead and roll. Oh my God. So I, apparently horrible rolling overall or great rolling for the union. So Union here, what is it? 11 plus 5, 16. 7 plus 9, 16. So straight even roll. What does that mean? Basically it means no effect. No effect whatsoever. Except the attackers are going to be flipped over to their exhausted side. So a very ineffective Confederate artillery bombardment of area 3. All right, first impulse. Let's go to the second impulse. Go ahead and roll. Three. Okay, so they keep momentum. The Confederates. Well, they definitely want to get some more men moved up. They don't they're they're worried about that though. So hmm, what are they gonna do? It's a little tough here. First off, the Confederates are saying, hey, you know what? We don't want this our we don't want this uh this cavalry out here running amok. So Confederates are gonna activate area 47 for assault. And they're gonna go ahead and move. Start moving their cavalry up. Stuart, Fitz Lee, um, WHF Lee, Stuart here, and then here. Here, here, and here, here. 
you're going to engage him in combat. Now, the artillery, the cavalry, excuse me, have a screening ability when infantry. So if it had been infantry advancing, they basically could kind of stop them there and then they can retreat from there, um, you know, which shows the advantage our uh, cavalry had. I want to say artillery, excuse me, because it's had the bombardment. Cavalry, the advantage cavalry had right over infantry. They weren't really going to be fighting each other, but they would be able to slow them down, screen them. Well, this is all art. This is all, again, I keep saying artillery. Jeez. This is all cavalry. So they're going to go ahead and fight it out here. All right. So just like a regular combat, go ahead and look at it. Um, let's see. It's going to be, we'll pick him as the lead attacker. Actually, we'll do, we'll just do Fitzley. Fitzley's lead attacker. Pleasanton as the lead defender. Well, only defender. Four. Fresh, two more, uh, one more fresh unit, excuse me. Five. Wilderness train. Six. You don't get the command bonus. And then Stewart's leading from the front. And he actually adds a plus two. Jackson, Lee, and Stewart, as you know, good leaders, are going to add an additional plus, plus one. So total plus two. So four, five, six, seven, eight. So eight for the attacker. And the old defender here, old Pleasanton, he has his defense of two. Three, four, five, and then that's it. All right, let's go ahead and roll it off. Eight plus five, 13. Eight plus six, 14. Oh, not great rolling for uh, the Confederates for their fighting today. So it is a success, though. So. Pleasanton will have to take one casualty point. Um, he will just go ahead and flip over to Exhausted. So he's not going to be able to do anything basically this turn. So, all right. The third impulse. And he's rolling. Four. Boom, so they go ahead and keep it. Let's see. They're going to... Hmm, I feel like maybe attacking there. What do you guys think? I want to open up a open up the flank move there, but uh, yeah, I think we should. Do. Don't you think you're gonna do that? I think to be staying aggressive, right? So AP Hill is gonna go ahead and push up on the uh, VP point here position. They don't want to lose that. So let's go ahead and have another combat. So uh, Confederates activating Area 44 for an assault activation. Make a little room here and start moving men in bunch of men and let's see and they'll go ahead and move i think every yeah those do everybody why not even if they get to move up next they can go back it's not they shouldn't be allowed to maneuver them too well because of the movement factor cost so all right let's have a little combat over here let's do it guys so combat resolution here and by the way, because they're moving into an area, it's, that's what I mean by mandatory combat. I think I don't know if I mentioned that before. So, lead attacking unit. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pick Archer here because he has a five attack factor. He's the highest. Each fresh unit. So, he has five. So, it'll be six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They are attacking. They don't have artillery bonus. They have command integrity. That makes it 11. They're attacking also from wilderness area to another wilderness area. That makes it 12. And Stuart, or excuse me, AP Hill makes it 13. He's assisting. He will, I'll have him lead from the front. Oh, he's getting up there, baby. He ain't holding back. All right, 13. And the defenders, it's going to go ahead and be the defending unit. Oh, let's go ahead and pick Humphreys here. That's a three. Um, any fresh units? Nope. So they don't get any bonus there. The area's defense TEM is three. So that's a total of six. The mandatory attack crossing a. Uh, river was not so no effect there and then they do have the mead leader there so that makes it a seven no entrenchment oh a seven uh oh doesn't look good for the union here but they've been rolling pretty hot so let's see what happens okay exact same so well not good for the union though because they needed to make up some ground so eight eight plus seven was that 15 eight eight plus 13 18, so, I'm going to do the math right, 15, 
Oh, no, 21. Yeah, 21. So I did not do the math right. Done. The good thing I double checked. So 21 versus 15. Oh, man. So six casualty points. So it's a success. Attacker rolled higher than defender. So and the defender has six, six casualty. Excuse me. Six casualty points. So what are we going to do with those? Let's see. Let's go ahead and move all these guys out of here. All right, six casualty points. First one has to go to the lead defending unit. I'm going to go ahead and just um, eliminate him. Exhausted unit eliminated is two. I'm going to go ahead and place him up here. Just kind of out of the way. Two. And they have four more, huh? Oh, man. Two. And they'll do... Let's see. And each one of... Each move... Each retreat is one. So, two. They... Three, four, and no retreat. They have to retreat. Now there's a retreat priority list. Free area adjacent to the least number of enemy controlled areas. It's going to probably be, it's going to be in this area here. So they'll have to retreat over here. So basically retreat back where they came. And that fulfills all the casualty point requirements. Um, five, six. Yep, that's it. And obviously Union loses control of that VP area. And AP Hill feels very good about himself. Now, all his men flip over to their exhausted side. Ooh, I thought the Union was going to be able to hold it. I really thought, so. I was like, oh man, I think the Union's going to be able to hold this. Or Union, excuse me. All right. I'm over. Boom, boom, boom. Okay. Whew. That's a tough one. Oh, I don't know, man. That's, that's tough for the Union. They just got kicked out of there and whooped too. But hey, they ain't done yet. They definitely got more units here. So. All right, that was it for the Confederates here. Go to Impulse 4, Momentum Retention Check, Failure. So it goes back down and flips over to the Union Impulse. Union gets to go. Union, let's see. In here, obviously not liking what's going on there. They need to get more, they need to kind of get more men over here, don't they? Sure do. Oh. And then go ahead and activate Area 73 with Hooker. Yep, that's what they'll do. And they'll get Hooker moving. One, two, three, four, five. And they'll send all these guys with them. One, two, three, four, five. Boom. Flipped over to Exhausted. So, Salt Activation. But they'll just do movement. And boom. They got Hooker over here now. A couple some infantry, artillery. Got to get those men over there to uh, get started. So, all right. Impulse up to the next one. Roll for momentum retention check. Successful, just barely, too, but that works. Union's going to go ahead. They're going to activate area 61. This um, engineer is going to go ahead and move here and stop. So next turn, when he's fresh, he'll be able to build. At the end of the turn, the Union can um, basically like deconstruct one of these pontoon bridges, and he can build one here if he chooses to. We'll see what we decide next turn. All right, so, yep, so that's that it for that impulse, so impulse three. That's what you see, sometimes you, know, you have to move pieces for strategic reasons or your tactical reasons, but it may only be one guy, right, one unit. Well, now you just spent the whole impulse moving one. You may not accomplish much in the short term, but maybe you have a long-term plan. Or at least I like to pretend I have a long-term plan, right? All right, so three, so we keep the impulse. Uni keeps the impulse. Uh, to do. Full up over here. You do. You could do some action over here, huh? So they're trying to push out, or what should they do? Oh, they're going to go ahead and activate Area 3 for artillery bombardment. Um, U.S. and New York artillery, and then go ahead and bombard VP Area... Well, yeah, VP Area 6 here. And that's what they'll do. So, artillery bombardment is what we talked about before. Um, we'll pick U.S. as the lead attacker with 4. Fresh artillery... So that's five. There's no hill here, so no bonus there. They do not have an artillery leader. Union artillery uh, leadership during this battle was poor. So four, five, and that's it, huh? Five. So that's you know not not a very good, not a very good number. But we'll see what the defenders have. Again, they are bombarding here. Defender is. TM of the target area. Oh, and then the, the unit they're targeting, by the way, they target the area, they're going to target the Macintosh artillery because they know it's a strong artillery piece. Artillery unit, I should say, right? So, 
uh, two uh, train modifier. No fresh artillery in this area. And no entrenched marker either. So only a two, huh? Uh-oh. Doesn't look too good for... Doesn't look too good for the old Confederate artillery over here. If I can find the two on this die, then it really would be trouble. Okay, five, two. And now we give us a roll with the V6s here. Boom! Yep, he's definitely going to look like he's going to take some hits. So, attacker, 7 plus 5, 12. Defender, 8 plus 2, 10. 12 to 10, two casualty points. Ah, bummer for Macintosh. He was the target of it. Two casualty points. Well, he can't, uh, you know, one, or treat as one. He has, to take, he has to take the two. So, all right, does it have to be him actually? Hang on. Um, defender must take casualty points equals the difference between the attacker and defender. Actually, it doesn't have to be all on him. So he'll take one for retreat. To retreat back here. And then one more. They have to take one more. They'll go ahead and just flip Jackson over to his exhausted side. Okay, Whew. not too bad then. Just force some artillery to retreat off there. Okay. Oh, and then I have to flip them over to Exhausted. All right. All right, let's go to Impulse 4. See if Momentum Retention check. A5, so they do maintain Momentum. Let's see here. All right, um, the Union yeah, Momentum. We're going to get Momentum. We'll go ahead and activate Area 3 for Assault Activation. And they're going to move. We're going to send Wadsworth into Area 2 here marker basically establishing and expanding their foothold and they'll send uh, that's it that's all they're gonna do they don't want to send any more they're uh they're holding tight here yeah they don't want to send too much so boom and so he will flip over to exhausted no actually oh what should i do i don't know what should i do yep that's gonna be it for now so that's it all right so that's the end of their the next impulse Momentum retention check. Oh, four. Less than a five, so they lose it. So it goes back over to the Rebels. Rebels here definitely still got some moves to make. They're going to go ahead and activate Zone D. This artillery, Washington. Go ahead and start moving him up. Um, they'll do... One, two, three... Four. They'll just join with AP Hill, or they don't want to be alone. That wouldn't be good. So, up over. Boom. Okay. First one. Momentum retention check. Successful. Second impulse. Confederates will go ahead and activate zone B. Brown uh, artillery. Go ahead and get him moved as well. Oh, they're going to have reinforce up here. So, one, two, and he'll join up here. Momentum retention check. Four, successful. Start moving some other units up for defense. They're going to activate... I'm trying to think, who, where do they want to send? Where do they want to send? So, the Confederates are going to go ahead and activate Area 11 here, right? Go ahead and start moving. One, two... Three, four. Exhausted. Impulse four. Oh, three, so they lose lose momentum. The Union's going to go ahead and activate Area 74 with their first impulse. Send Reynolds across. One, two, three, four. And stop here. Then double day will follow along with Robinson. So again, establishing their foothold over here across the river. Pulse goes up. Momentum retention check. Pass. Second impulse. Union, they don't... Hmm. They don't want to give too much away yet. They're, I feel like they're kind of, they have, an, they have a plan for next turn. So they've established their beachhead here. Oh, beachhead, you know what I mean. <laughs> Establish their foothold across the river, across the Rappahannock. 
Uh, look at these guys right here. Maybe building here and maybe crossing. We'll see. Or maybe they'll be moving somewhere else. You know, old sickles, you never know. And then here they have some fresh units. But, and then these guys are going to come out and where are they? Move maybe around this way. These will probably advance here. Confederates are also trying to get their defenses set, really. So the Union, I think they're good. So the Union's going to go ahead and pass. So it goes back over to the Confederates. Confederates are looking. They don't want to engage in this combat yet. They want to wear them down a little bit more. They don't want to move these units here because they have to worry about him. Same thing with McLaws. McLaws and Early, all those units for right now. But what they will do, well, they can't. They don't want to mess these up either. So they're going to go and activate Area 21. Anderson is going to go ahead and move up to Banks Ford, Area 22. Move him over. And he's going to follow. That's because they see those Federals. Federal's massing over there, and they're like, oh, no. And then they saw the engineer unit with his big old pontoon bridge, and they're like, oh, crap, here we go. <laughs> so second impulse. Momentum attention check. Ooh, just, mat just made it. So Confederates still have momentum. They do have, what do they have, one more unit that's out here? Yep, they want to get him up. So Iverson here is going to activate zone A. Go ahead and get him moved up. He's just going to go ahead and move into area four here. Bolster them up for a future attack down here to try to drive the Federals back. So, or possibly not. Maybe just try to hold. Maybe they're going to, just like historically, uh, Rebels are going to send some more men over here. We'll see. Um, impulse three. Two, as they fail. So it goes back over to the Union. Again, the Union's good. Union's good, I think. You know, you you know, expert strategists in this game probably have, oh, you can do this, this. I feel pretty good right now as a Union. So they're going to go ahead and pass. Comes back over the Rebels. Again, the Rebels are looking pretty good. Trying to see what they think for their defenses here. They're probably going to have to start moving some units over here, though. But they don't want to give up this spot yet. Oh, that's a tough one. What do they do? Oh, it's a tough one. Send McLaws, too. We could probably do that. No, but they want to be ready just in case crossing here, too. So you know what? They're going to pass. That's two passes in a row. That means the turn is going to end. So now we go on to the reorganization phase. Um, this is what I mentioned before, where, you know, you can el return eliminated units if you want. Um, if you have the advantage, which the Rebels had it, they just didn't use it, um, didn't feel appropriate. But either side can go ahead and take units. And then, again, the regular reorganization, if you don't have the advantage, is you take one eliminated unit and remove it from the game entirely. And the other one, let's see which one's better on the front side. Okay, definitely Sykes. So, yep, sorry, Humphreys, you got to go. Humphreys is gone from the game, gone from the battle. Sykes, we're going to go ahead and put him back. Um, we can put him on his fresh side in any area that's friendly controlled, vacant, so no enemies, um, contains one other friendly unit. So they're going to go ahead and, um, well, they'll go ahead and place him up here. And uh, let's see, has to be, what is it again? Friendly, fresh side in any area, friendly controlled, vacant. Yep, so basically he pops back up there. So we you can look at it, you know, thematically is, hey, you know, those two were routed, right? And they, you know, fled, they retreated, slash ran away. But Sykes, his men were able to be rallied enough that they were able to return to the fight. Pretty common in the American Civil War, by the way. Uh, the Federates, well, they didn't lose any they didn't lose any men, so they're good to go. Some battling, definitely some battling, but a lot of maneuvering as well. Obviously, key part of this battle anyway. All right, reorganization phase is done. Go to the end phase. Um, you determine if either side has won automatic victory, which if not... So that would be if the Confederates controlled all of every area on this side of the Rappahannock and the Rapidan, and then, or if the Union can trace a line of control from, I believe it's these zones over here, all the way through, down to, should be zones, these zones over here. I'd have to double check, but basically, they clearly do not have it right now. Um, they've been blunted so far. All right. Neither players won, so... First, you flip all exhausted units to the fresh side. I won't make you guys watch me flip, you know, 50 units over, so no worries. Um, Reroll markers are returned. So remember those cool reroll markers over here. So go ahead and each side, you know, get those back. Um, advance the turn marker. So the game turn track goes up to turn two here. April 30th was the start. May 1st, turn two. Then if it was the last turn, you would check for victory points by counting the victory points. Uh, it was over there. Remember, I mentioned during my little overview. However, I got the dice tower on the way because I'm not worried about the victory points because we're not going to play six turns uh, for you guys to keep track of all that. So, whew, 
And technically with the limited units, um, you're supposed to, I think you're supposed to put them on the turn track to keep track of them. It's sort of, it gets a little crazy for me, so I just set them aside because I clearly they're eliminated. All right. Yeah, actually. So yeah, so it would be eliminated on turn one. Sorry for the victory point reasons. Excuse me. So we put them there. Um, okay, so now it'd be turn two. We're not going to play the turn, but I want to show you guys the momentum phase. Very, very simple. The union had momentum on turn one automatically. Now we're going to do a, a roll off. 1d6. Is that all? No. For every one of these areas with the white star, so here, you know, Banks Ford, the, uh, what's it called here? Well, Chancellorsville, I guess, is where the name of the area. The Chancellorsville area, Banks Ford, and then the actual Mary's Heights over here, you get a plus one. Obviously, they're all controlled by the Confederates, so they're going to get a plus, plus three total on their die roll. Tie, right? So four for the Union, one plus three, so that's four. Uh-oh, what does that mean? Basically four. Well, Confederates also win ties. So you can see where the game starts. Union has a big advantage. By turn two, it starts kind of swinging, and the Confederates have some, at least some advantages. So it does start with, so you have a game turn marker would be on the butternut side, as it was, show they have the advantage, and then I'll use a butternut for the impulse marker to show that the Confederates start with the impulse. In addition, because they won in the momentum phase, um, the Confederate units with five movement factors, which is everybody except for the cavalry, gets a plus one movement factor for all this turn. So the, the Confederates will be able to maneuver just a little bit of an advantage, a little bit of an edge, a little bit more than the Union. So, whew. I think we covered pretty much everything when it can, when it comes to the actual playthrough part of it. You guys should have a great idea of how to play the game, how the system works, how this particular game works in the system. Hopefully, I've explained it enough. Hopefully, you guys understand. If you have any questions or if I made a mistake, let me know below. No problem there. You know, it, it, good to see corrections just so we can make sure everyone's on the same page. Make sure I'm playing the game right and everyone's playing the game right. But hopefully, we did it pretty well. Hopefully, we got it pretty accurate as far as how the system goes. So... Thank you so much, guys, for making it this far. You know, you know the deal, guys. You know, give me a little thumbs up, a like on the video if you did like it. Um, if you didn't, just tell me what you know what you didn't like about it. Otherwise, until next time, guys. Later.